الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم اجعلنا منهم ومن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر آمين يا رب العالمين أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الناس ضرب مثل فاستمعوا له إن الذين تدعون من دون الله لن يخلقوا ذبابا ولا اجتماعوا له وإن يسلبهم الذباب منه شيئا لا يستنقذوه منه ضعف الطالب والمطلوب ما قدر الله حق قدره إن الله قوي عزيز رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي واللهم ثبتنا عند الموت بلا إله إلا الله واللهم اجعلنا من الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر آمين يا رب العالمين Today inshallah I will speak to you about one of the benefits of the name of Allah Al-Qawi Al-Qawi means the strong or the mighty and the powerful but in order to understand this very incredible word that describes the name of Allah and its meanings, obviously, for, as the moment you hear it, you can understand that Allah is all-powerful and capable over everything. But the way in which Allah describes this name and places this name at the end of Surah Al-Hajj is absolutely remarkable. And it's probably one of the most place, important places, I would argue, in the Qur'an to understand the benefits for Allah being Al-Qawi for a believer. So we all believe in His names, but each one of those names benefits us in some way. It helps us in some way. And how does the name Al-Qawi help us? One of the best places to learn that is at the end of the 22nd surah of the Mus'haf, uh, Surah Al-Hajj. In the surah, Allah gives an example to help humanity understand something about Himself. He says, يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ ضُرِبَ مَثَلٌ فَاسْتَمِعُوا لَهُ People, an example is being given, listen to it carefully. That's how he starts. An example is being given, listen to it carefully. You know, usually Allah says, Allah gave an example. This time He says, an example is being given. Instead of mentioning Himself. So He removed the speaker from the conversation. So that's the, a side note, but an important one that I'd like you to understand. You see, I'm standing here in front of you right now. I look a certain way. I have a beard. I'm dressed like this. I have a kufi on my head, etc. And you can listen to me, and you can listen to me recite something of the Qur'an or share something with you. But imagine a scenario in which you're waiting for me to come and speak and this 16 year old kid comes up here and he's got tattoos on his arm and he's got you know a t-shirt on and jeans and a baseball hat on backwards and before he even gets up on the mic some people are running for the door some people are thinking do they have to make their salah again you know some people some people are thinking you know we're, we should somebody should take him off the and he starts speaking and he gives the best speech you've ever heard and he quotes, and he cites, and he gives a reminder that you can't imagine, you've never heard something more powerful. Now, those of you that are looking at him, have a very hard time benefiting from what he's saying, because the moment you see him, like, why is this guy even talking? But imagine somebody on the other side, outside, because the microphone works outside, yes? And they only heard his speech. So the people inside are saying, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah. And the people outside are saying what? MashaAllah, MashaAllah. <laughs> Well, the reason I'm giving you this example is because before we judge what is being said, human beings can't help it, they judge what? what do you, the appearance. They, we are so focused on the appearance that we leave behind what's actually being said. So we size people up and we say, well, whatever this person has to say, probably not worth listening to. Or whatever this person has to say, probably worth more listening to. Just because of how they look. It could be because of the color of their skin sometimes. It could be because of the way they're dressed or their age. These things that are on the outside, we immediately form an opinion, maybe I should be more carefully listening to this or not listening to this at all, even before a person opens their mouth. Allah in this ayah removes, removes focus on the speaker. He says an example is being given. An example is being struck. Leave aside Allah is giving it or the messenger is giving it. or Forget who's giving it, just focus on the example itself. And that's because a lot of people in the world, the moment they hear Allah said, they say, oh, here we go, another khutbah. Let me watch something else. The moment you hear the messenger said, ah, come on, can we talk about oh, all this religious stuff? Can we talk about something else? So the moment they hear that Allah is the one speaking, or the messenger is the one speaking, some people just tune out. They don't want to hear it. So Allah does, what does He do in this remarkable example? He says, this is for all of humanity. Ya ayyuhan nas. And, and not all of humanity is interested in listening to Allah. So Allah says, even if you're not interested in listening to Him, listen to the example. 
فَاسْتَمِعُوا لَهُ Then listen to it carefully, give it a chance. So he, call, he, he describes something about himself now. And he says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ تَدْعُونَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ لَنْ يَخْلُقُوا ذُبَابًا All of those that you're calling on, other than Allah, they can't even create one fly. One fly. Even if all of them had gathered together for the project of producing and creating one single fly. And as you listen to that, you say, what's the point of Allah telling us they can't even create a fly? What's the point of that? And let's go further. And, the, and a fly is not exactly an impressive creature. Actually, and a fly is one of the most important, like annoying you know, creations that human beings experience. You want to get rid of them, you see them and you just want them to go away, etc. Or a place that's dirty or a place that's you know, or if you have good food and flies show up, they're ruining the food, right? So you want to get rid of the flies. Allah says they couldn't even create a single fly. But He adds something. He says, وَإِن يَسْلُبْهُمُ الذُّبَابُ شَيْءً لَا يَسْتَنْقِذُهُ مِنْهُ If the fly, this one fly, first of all, they can't create it. They can't create it. Then this fly, let's just say you're eating your food and it came and sat on your food for a second. And it rubs its legs and it takes a little bit of your food. And then you do this and it flies away. And Allah says, if, there, if a fly came and took something of their food, all of humanity can gather together and they can't get back that one piece of food. That's what he says about, they can't rescue it back. They can't rescue it back. Now imagine human beings, some human beings are weak, some human beings are strong, some human beings are poor, some human beings are wealthy, some human beings are powerless, they don't even have a home. Other human beings have the power to launch nuclear weapons. Other human beings control the mightiest armies on earth in history and today. So even if Fir'aun, who had the largest army on earth, was sitting at home eating a burger, and a fly came and disrespected the king. Can you imagine if a king is eating food and somebody says, Hey, I like that. Can you, let me try some of that ketchup. They're going to die. But a fly comes and does what? Takes a little bit of his food. And even if Fir'aun gets really angry, how dare this fly take my food? I want it back. No one dare take from me. Even if they caught that fly, what are they going to do? They can't get that food back. Now Allah in this remarkable ayah showed something else too. People used to worship idols in the past. Yeah, When they used to worship idols, a lot of you know, religions where they worship idols, they bring food to the idols. So they bring you know, milk and the honey and like you know, chocolate, ice cream, I don't know, whatever they bring, they put it in front and then they do their prayers. Now, the, usually these temples, they're open door. And you have this statue, and you have this food lying in front. Guess what shows up? These flies show up. And this giant statue of a god that they worship, it shows up, it sits on its nose and tells him, hey, I'm going to eat your sandwich, you don't mind, right? And then it goes and it takes their food and then it flies off. And their god is powerless to defend. And by the way, that same food, that they put as you know, altars and they, they sacred food, right? They, they blow over it, they pray over it, etc. If you went and said, hey, that's my favorite chocolate, and you tried to get some of it, what would they do to you? They'd kill you if you eat it. That's, sac that's sacrilegious. And yet, their religion gets humiliated by what? Every, every moment. Flies. Allah says, the fly is teaching you that these gods are powerless. The fly is teaching you that. So Allah says, I'll give you a small example. Those of you who you call on other than Allah, first of all, can't even create a single fly. And if the fly was to take even a little bit from them, how are they going to get it back? Interestingly enough, I got curious about flies because of this ayah. Like, what, how do flies eat? And what I didn't know that I learned a long time ago when I was studying this ayah, is when flies sit on food, they release saliva, they release spit, and they create a bag with their spit. And the food goes inside this bag and they carry it away. And the bag is made of acid. So the moment it touches the food, it has a chemical reaction and the food changes forever. So if you developed a technology to prove the ayah wrong, and you found a way to capture that fly, and put it under a petri dish, and then get scientists to get that little piece of your burger back, it's gone the moment the fly touched it. You can't get it back. لَا يَسْتَنْقِذُهُ مِنْهُ ضَعُفَ الطَّالِ And then comes the lesson, the, 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 the discussion I wanted to have with you today is Allah being mighty. What does it have to do with this? Allah adds a principle. And actually first, if you understand this principle, then you will understand or appreciate this name of Allah Azza wa Jal. Allah Azza wa Jal says, ضَعُفَ الطَّالِبُ وَالْمَطْلُوبُ This is one of the most powerful thing, statements in the Qur'an. You know how in, in every language there are sayings, proverbs, idioms, right? This is one of those things in the Qur'an that's like a saying. 
that you should just you should have this framed or you should think about this every day kind of saying. And it's a very small statement, ضعف الطالب والمطلوب. But it's a very powerful truth. And what does it mean? It means the one who is seeking and the thing that is being sought. There's two things. The one who is seeking and whatever is being sought are both naturally weak. The seeker is weak and whatever they're seeking is also weak. Now let's think about seeker and whatever they're seeking. Some young man is seeking to get married. Somebody seeking to get a job. Somebody else is seeking to make more money. Somebody is seeking to fix their health problem. Somebody is seeking to fix their financial problem or somebody is seeking to fix a family problem. Everybody is seeking something. Everybody is missing something in their life and there's basically two things we're running after. Either you're running after something good that you don't have yet. You drive by and you see the nice house, you're like, one day, one day, I'm gonna... Or you have this, this, this car you really like and you look at the car you say, well, I'm, I really want that car. And then you keep checking your balance and not enough, not enough, not enough. Just 12 more years. Eventually, you know, then I'm coming for you, you know. And so you have all human beings, there's something that they desire that they don't have yet, that they want. That's one kind of seeking. And the other kind of seeking is we have problems. We have something missing in our life or some, some, some you know, difficulty or sadness or family issue or lack of peace or whatever's going on. And we're seeking to get rid of the problem. Either we're seeking to add something good or seeking to remove something bad. That's basically what human beings are seeking in life, isn't it? And Allah says, you, because you're always seeking something, are weak. You're weak. You're seeking money, you're weak. You're seeking peace, you're weak. You're seeking calm, you're weak. You're seeking safety, you're weak. You're seeking happiness, you're weak. <laughs> you're seeking status, you're weak. You're seeking the degree, you're weak. You're seeking to get married, you're weak. You're seeking to have a child, you're weak. You're seeking to get your kids married, you're weak. Everything you're seeking makes you what? Weak. And everything that you're seeking is also weak. Now what, I understand because I don't have those things, I'm weak. But how is the thing that I'm seeking also weak? You know, the things that people seek, I'll give you an example. Sometimes people seek, the, 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 the most telling example of this, I was actually, many years ago, I was sitting in an abnormal psychology class, and our professor gave the example of a young man in the late 70s who was doing his PhD in NYU, in psychology actually, in clinical psychology at the New York University. And back then, they didn't have email or hard drives or whatever. This guy typed up his 450-page thesis and submitted it to the department for year, five years of work. He submitted it to the department, no extra copies. The original copy he submits to the department. The department loses his thesis. Five years of work, gone. And this was, you know, up until the mid-90s, this, this guy was older now, he walks around NYU campus telling people, don't go to school here, they'll steal your work, they'll ruin your life, don't learn here, they're a bunch of crooks. And he sees people handing their papers in, and he says, don't give it to them, they'll lose it. And they, every few weeks they have to take him into a psych ward. And then, but they have to let him go, and he comes back wandering NYU campus again. And this was a case study of, and I heard, I'm reading this, and we're discussing it in class, and I'm going, subhanAllah, da'uf al-talibu wal-matloob. This man, for those years, what was the biggest thing on his mind? This degree. This is what I'm working for. This is all I, this, when I have this, I will be successful. I will have this label. I will have accomplished the fruit of my labor. All those years of work will finally mean something. And he was so weak after this one thing. Nothing else mattered. And when that goes away, because that thing, what you're seeking, isn't very strong, it disappeared. It disappeared. And when it disappears, what happens to you? You collapse. So Allah is teaching us something. We are actually weak because the things we're running after are what? Weak. We think they're going to make us strong. We think getting that is going to give us some kind of recognition. Or it's going to make us safer. If we have more money, we'll be happier. If we're going to have these problems solved, then things, everything is going to be perfect. If we just owned a house, we keep living in this apartment, we're paying rent, we're losing money. If we just owned a house, everything will be okay. And then you get into the house, and then there's property tax, and then the bathroom plumbing doesn't work, and then the kitchen goes bad, and the foundation is shaking, and the wall's cracking, and there's mold, and the neighbor's driving you crazy, and the window breaks, and all these problems show up, and what you thought was going to make, bring, take all your problems away, becomes problem on top of problem on top of problem. We keep running after things that are what? Weak. And every time we do, it proves how weak we are. 
When we're, you're constantly thinking about, if I just had that, I would be okay. If only this problem went away. This person that's making my life miserable, if only somehow they got hit by a bus, my life would be so good. You know, every time I see a bus, I make dawah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> we tell ourselves, you know, if some people were removed, or some problems were removed from our life, everything would be perfect. Or if just this one sadness would go away, everything would be perfect. You know, if people changed, if our, society, if our situation changed, if our environment changed, we keep thinking everything else changes, and then we're going to be happy, everything's going to be perfect, then I, I don't have to be weak anymore. And we're preoccupied with, you know, consuming and consuming and consuming. And Allah Azza wa describes, you know how weak you are? You are weaker than a fly. You're weaker than a fly. ضَعُفَ الطَّالِبُ وَالْمَطْلُوبُ And when he describes how inherently, incredibly weak I am, think about the things that are running in your mind every day. Every one of you has different things on your mind every day. You know, we're fasting, we're praying, and alhamdulillah, we try to concentrate when we're praying. But outside of that, what is on your mind? What are you worried about? What are you thinking about? What's constantly spinning in your head? What is it that you constantly wish you had or wish you didn't have anymore? Somebody, for somebody, it's their sickness or it's their depression or their sadness or this person or what, if, if only they could be happy with me, I would be okay. Some people run after making somebody happy. If only my dad would be proud of me, ah, I would be happy. Everything would be fine. Everything would be... But your dad is a human being. And even if they are proud of you one day, their life can go the next day. Then what are you going to do? Then where do you stand? So you and I keep running after these things that we feel will make us happy and in the next ayah Allah Azza wa says مَا قَدَرُ اللَّهَ حَقَّ قَدْرِهِ They didn't value Allah like He deserved to be valued. إِنَّ اللَّهَ قَوِيٌّ عَزِيزٌ Certainly Allah is powerful. You are weak. Allah is powerful. And then He says you didn't value Allah like He deserved to, you, he deserved to be valued. You know what He's telling you and me? He's telling you and me you will run after things. And you will run after people. And you will run after everything in this world. Whatever, you come, whatever your mind comes up with that you're running after, every one of those things will die. Every one of those things is weak. And that's why you've been weak. That's why you keep suffering sadness. That's why you keep suffering loss. But when you decide once and for all that the one thing you're seeking more than anything else is to make your master happy. When you seek Allah, when you value Him above all else, when you really in your heart decide that, then because He is strong, you know Allah just taught us, when you seek something weak, you become weak. But if you seek Allah who is mighty and strong, what does it make you? It, you, it makes you strong. It makes you strong. And once you become strong, things come in life and things go in life, you're still strong. You don't collapse because the things you were running after collapse. Because you're pursuing much, something much, much higher. And please understand what I'm saying. I'm not saying you shouldn't seek things in this world. I'm not saying that. But the ayah is teaching us something. Even as we seek those things, we understand that they're weak. And that even if they come and they go, the one thing that we cannot lose is Allah. You see, the failure of a human being is, when they don't get what they want, they lose Allah. When they don't get what they want, they stop praying. When they don't get what they want, they say, I was making all this dua, it didn't work. What's the point? When they don't get what they want, they get filled with sadness and anxiety and tell themselves, I can't even get myself to talk to Allah anymore. You see, that's because from the beginning, before the problem happened, not after, before the problem happened, there was not a strong bond with Allah yet. When that strong bond with Allah is already there, like roots inside a, on, in the ground, when a storm comes, the tree will shake, but it won't collapse. It'll still be there. And after the storm is done, it will still give fruit. It will still continue to live. Asluha thabit wa faru'uha fi sama Quran says, La ilaha illallah is like a tree whose roots are deep inside the ground and his branches keep going into the sky. That's the strength of a human being. I'll give you a, a, you know, a really powerful example of this strength, this inner strength. You know, we associate strength with different things. And this is a story I spoke about many years ago, but it still moves me to this day. I knew a family in the state of New Orleans in, in the United States. And this family was very wealthy, they had, a, they had many car dealerships. And New Orleans is on the coast, so they had car dealerships right on the beach. Right? And luxury cars, they would import cars and sell them and import and sell them. And then Hurricane Katrina came. 
And when Katrina came, of course, it starts with the water. So all of their cars that were bought in cash were flooded. And the only car they had left was this Lexus. I remember they had that Lexus, an LS something, that they escaped in. The family escaped in one car. And a few months after the storm had receded and the, you know, the city was opened up again, I went to visit that family. And they, they, the whole family, who were literally making, I think it was something to the tune of a quarter of a million dollars a month. That's the kind of money they were making. And now, they were delivering pizza in that Lexus. That's what the family does. They, open, they, 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 they were hired by some other guy who runs a pizzeria, and the mom and the dad are in the back making pizzas, and the son goes around delivering the pizzas in the Lexus. And when I, went, when I saw that, you know, you, can you imagine if somebody else went through that? Like some other millionaire went from that to nothing? You know what happened to them? They'd take a, you know, a bottle of pills and be done with it. Because what they had, this was what made them strong. When this goes away, I can't handle this anymore. I can't take it. I can't take this kind of loss anymore. You know? And so, but this family, when I met them, every one of them, so calm, so peaceful. And the father, and the father was an older man. And I would think at that age, if you suffer this kind of loss, you'd get a heart attack, you'd get high blood pressure, you'd get some, but he's completely relaxed. And I'm just, and I, I just asked him, how? I didn't even finish my question. I just said, how? And he smiled, because he knows what I'm talking about. And he says to me, you know, before when business was good, all the time I was on my phone, did the shipment arrive? Did the payment come late? Did the car get delivered? Is the customer happy? Did we do the taxes? Employee problems? This problem, that problem? And I barely made it to Jummah. Barely. Now, there's still food on the table. There's still a roof over our head. But I get to go to the masjid and go pray in peace. And I get to, get to go out, get, get up in the morning, and I don't have to think about anything except remembering my Rabb and thanking him. Actually, I, I pretty much feel that before my life ended, Allah gave me this blessing of simplifying my life. That's what the father says. A normal human being will not say that. If you said that to another businessman, you'll say, man, this guy lost his mind. He's clearly traumatized and he's lost his, you know, his senses and he's trying to rationalize this to himself and he's trying to cope with it in this way. But let me tell you, this is what happens when a person recognizes that the thing we run after is what? Is weak and only Allah, only Allah, only Allah is strong. You know, there are people, it's not just money by the way, I give you an example of money. For some people it's going to be people. You're running after the approval of someone or you're clung to someone. Like if they're not there, you're going to die. If you're not, if, if you know, there's unhealthy attachments to people. Even Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa would tell us, Ahbib habibaka haunamma. Love the one you love to an extent. To an extent. Because beyond that is only for Allah azza wa jalla, isn't it? But when that happens, when people love someone, and they're attached to someone, and they just want them at, no matter what the cost, then they're even willing to sacrifice what Allah says is halal or haram. Because they love the one. They want that one. And that's it, that's all they want. Sometimes people do this for their father or their mother. Sometimes they do it for a spouse. Sometimes they do it for a friend. Some, some, sometimes people do it even for not, not a legitimate relationship. Then no matter what, I just want to be with this person. I will do whatever it takes. And those human beings that you're running after, who you're so attached to, they are also weak. They're also weak. And they're making you weak. They're making you weak. And so when they go and you collapse, you see, how attached was Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to our mother Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha? How devastated was he when she passed away? But he had something much stronger to keep him going, isn't it? He had Allah azza wa jal and he keeps on going. How devastating is it to suffer the losses that he suffered and he keeps on moving forward because he gets strength from the one who owns all strength. He gets strength from that. So you and I have to find that in Allah azza wa jal. We have to recognize in ourselves that we are by definition weak. We are not capable of coping with loss. We are not capable of you know, finding true contentment and happiness once we have something. We're not capable of that. Only Allah Azza wa can give us that. Now if I, I know usually I finish in about 15-20 minutes. If you can give me 7 or 8 more minutes, I just want to finish some things about these ayat that I feel is connected and I think you can benefit from inshaAllah ta'ala. Okay? So bear with me. Those of you that want to escape can qu quietly walk backwards, I won't notice. I won't tell anyone. Okay, so... I'm gonna give you a, a crazy example to get this point across, and then we'll come to the ayah, okay? Imagine for a moment you cannot find a job. You're looking for a job, you keep sending your email with your resume and your CV, and nobody's giving you a call. 
And finally, this, you know, and you have no great skills. I mean, you know how to use Google. That's your, your resume doesn't say much, you know. And you know how to use the internet, and I'm good at Facebook or something. That's what it says. And you get a call from this technology company, and they call you in for an interview. And you're sitting there in this interview, and you know that they're, and the, the job opening is for a programmer. And you, the programming is, you know, it's like, it's on the other end of the universe from you. So you're even thinking, why did I get called here? And so you sit in the table waiting for the guy to come in to interview you. He comes in, he has a big stack of papers. He starts reading them and telling you, yeah, our, our job requires about 12, 20 years of experience and you must know this programming language and this programming language and this programming language. And if you have management experience, that's good also. And, this, and he keeps going over the list of what? Qualifications. And you're listening to this going, uh, is he just trying to embarrass me? Is there, is there any way I can get out from that window before he notices? Is he looking at the wrong resume? Did somebody else have the same name as me and they called me by mistake? You don't see yourself qualified, do you? And you're thinking, how can I possibly be given this job? This job is not for me. I am not right for this job. Allah Azza wa Jal in the Quran says, وَجَاهِدُوا فِي اللَّهِ حَقَّ جِهَادِهِ Struggle, try your best for no one other than Allah the way He deserves to be tried for. Now that's impossible. That's what you call an impossible job. Does anybody pray to Allah like he deserves to be prayed to? Does anybody thank Allah like he deserves to be thanked? Does anybody remember Allah like he deserves to be remembered? It's impossible. Does anybody struggle to please Allah like he deserves to? Like he deserves. We can never do to the standard that he deserves. When he gave us this job in the ayah, he clearly gave us a job that is impossible for you and me to qualify for. You understand that? Okay, just like that guy sitting in the interview, like, this is impossible for me. And then the interviewer looks at him in the face and says, Congratulations, you got the job. And when he says, You got the job, you're so, uh, Are you sure? Uh, why? Even you're like, I, I can't do this. I don't know any of this. I don't understand any of it. I'm not right for this job. I'm sure you mean other people that are much better at it. And you know what? Exactly that attitude many Muslims have. Allah wants me to try for Him. But yeah, I know there are other people that are much better believers than I am. That's not me. I'm a special case that doesn't really fit in this struggle business. You know, that's where, the, that's where much stronger Muslims. That's not me. And Allah says, تَبَاكُمْ He chose you based on your qualifications. That's the word ijtiba. Based, he chose you because you're the right person for the job, man or woman. He chose you for the struggle. What? But, but I'm not qualified. I don't know. And basically the interviewer tells this guy, listen, I know you don't think you, you got the skills, but I know talent when I see it. I know potential when I see it. I know I've done this a long time. I know exactly who I hire and who, exactly who I don't hire. Not only will I hire you, you will be the best employee in the company. He has this confidence in the employee that even the employee doesn't have in himself. Allah chooses you and me and He has a confidence in you and me that we will actually value Allah like He deserves to be valued. Remember that phrase? مَا قَدَرُ اللَّهَ حَقَّ قَدْرِهِ كَيْفَ نَقْدِرُ اللَّهَ حَقَّ قَدْرِهِ نُجَاهِدْ فِي اللَّهَ حَقَّ جِهَادِهِ How will you value Allah the way He deserves to be valued? When you struggle to make Allah happy the way He deserves it. And even if you think you can't, Allah says, actually, you're the right people for the job. There are, there's five times as many of you on the earth that never got to say, La ilaha illallah, aren't there? And He chose you. He chose you to say it. He chose you to say, Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa didn't He? You didn't have to be born in a Muslim family. You could have been born in a Buddhist family. He, some of you took shahada. You could have never found Islam. Allah chose you. Your heritage didn't choose you. You know, the, the baby, the soul is brought from the angel into the womb of the mother. That, in, that soul could have been brought to any mother. But he chose your mother. He chose that family. He chose to give you this Islam. He chose to give you this la ilaha illallah. And he tells you in this ayah, why did I choose you? Because you have the skills to do for me what you need to do. What, as it deserves to be done. And so now, okay, fine, fine. If you believe in me, I guess I'll try. But I know it's going to be really hard. He says, وَمَا جَعَلَ عَلَيْكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ مِنْ حَرَجْ By the way, he put no difficulty, no pressure in the religion for you. 
And so he says, oh, okay, okay, so it's not going to be any pressure. It's, it's going to be easy. Okay. You know, when Allah gives you comfort and says, don't worry about it, I'll make it what? Easy. You get a little more relaxed. Okay, Allah says, impossible job at first, but then he said, if he can make it easy, then, you know, it'll become easy. I have more hope in myself now. And as he tells you he's making it easy, the next phrase in the ayah is, Millata abikum Ibrahim. By the way, you are the same religion as your father who? Ibrahim, and I say, hold on a second. I thought you said easy. You just said easy, right? So like Ibrahim salam, like jump in the fire Ibrahim, and cut the sun Ibrahim, and leave the family in the desert Ibrahim, and challenge your whole tribe Ibrahim, and get kicked out of, by, out of your home by your dad Ibrahim, that same Ibrahim salam, about whom Allah says, وَإِذِ ابْتَلَىٰ إِبْرَاهِيمَ رَبُّهُ بِكَلِمَاتِ Allah tested Ibrahim salam, with instructions like nobody else. Meaning his tests were harder than anybody else. Allah just said, your trial, don't worry, he'll make it really easy for you. Just like who? Ibrahim and Allah, no way. Wait, wait, hold on. <laughs> How do we understand that? You understand that by thinking about it in a very particular way. Allah is telling you, the same Allah that will make a fire cool. The same Allah that will make a knife refuse to cut. The same Allah that will bring water out of a burning hot desert. The same Allah that can make the most impossibly difficult things easy for Ibrahim is the religion you follow. What problem do you have? You have the same Rabb behind you. So he reminds us of Ibrahim and says, you got it, you got this. This is a religion of your father Ibrahim. He's the one who named you Muslims much before and even now. Even now. And so then finally, he gives us instructions. Where do you get started? You know, you don't go into the job and do the highest level work. From the beginning, there's an orientation. Beginning tasks. Where do you start? He says, فَأَقِيمُ الصَّلَاةَ وَآتُ الزَّكَاةَ وَاعْتَصِمُ بِاللَّهِ هُوَ مَوْلَاكُمْ He says, establish the prayer. Establish the prayer. What does that mean? You want Allah's strength? Remember that? You want Allah's strength inside you? You don't want to be weak? Then you better not let go of what? You don't let go of your prayer. Your prayer will become your strength. Which is why he says, sabri wa Seek aid, seek might, seek strength from the prayer. Seek strength, the prayer will make you strong. Never let go of the prayer. Even if you're not feeling it, you pray. Even if you're getting lazy, you pray. Even if you don't feel like it, you pray. Even if your heart isn't in it, you pray. Because if you let go of the prayer, you have become the weaker, weakest and weakest and weakest. Then you have nothing left. Aqimu salah. Then he says, Wa'atu zakah. And give zakat, meaning cleanse your money. Zakat doesn't just mean two and a half percent. I know Ramadan, everybody wants to give the zakat. But listen, you can't give zakat on haram money. You gotta make good clean money before you give clean money. You see? A lot of times I see people, in, Muslims unfortunately get involved in haram businesses. And they're really big on giving zakat. They want to give a huge donation to masajid after running a liquor store. Why? Because they feel guilty. They feel like, oh, I've earned plenty of haram, at least I should, you know, sponsor a few orphans now. You know, your, this good deed doesn't justify those bad deeds. Zakat actually is to cleanse the money that's pure to begin with. You know, sometimes the Muslims are so obsessed with, is the chicken halal or not? Who slaughtered it? Where did it come from? Was the blood drained properly? Let me see the certificate. Let me see the certificate of the certificate. Who signed the certificate? Let me find them. Tell me their shoe size. Tell me everything about them. And that same guy who's so obsessed with how the chicken was slaughtered is okay with collecting riba. The same guy is not making payment, is lying about his taxes, cheating people, not giving his customer his due. <laughs> You're, that's haram too, bro. So if you, if you get your haram money and buy halal chicken, <laughs> that's still not halal chicken, you understand? <laughs> so when Allah has established the prayer, and give the zakah, it actually doesn't just mean give the zakah, it means clean up your money matters. Clean up all of your money matters. That's the starting point. And when you can do those th two things, وَاَتَصِمُوا billah, Then hold on tight to Allah. Hold on to, for dear life to Allah. I'tisam means to hold on for life. I'tisam is when somebody falls off a ship, and there's a storm, and they're holding on to the chain hanging from the ship, the anchor. Because if they let go, they're going to drown. That's i'tisam. So hold on for dear life to Allah. Huwa mawlakum. He is your protecting, guarding master. He is your guardian. Fani'mal mawla. What an incredible guardian.
What an incredible protector. Wa ni'man nasir. Look at this last name of Allah. And I'll end with this. Wa ni'man nasir. He says, what an incredible aid. Aid at Nusra in Arabic means when you help someone in war. Like, you know, if, if somebody says, hey, can you help me? Can you give me a pen? That's not Nusra. That's Musa'ada. That's another word. Small help. Or somebody had a flat tire and you gave them help with their tire. That's, that's help. But that's not Nusra. Nusra is our armies being invaded. We're being attacked from all sides. We need reinforcements. And they drop supplies or they send another thousand troops. That's called what? Nusra. Like, إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ So when great help, mighty help comes, that's actually called Nusra. And Allah uses His name Nasir. He says, when you do these things, when you establish the prayer, when you clean up your money matters, and you hold on to Allah in your heart, then you see what an amazing protector He is. And you'll see what kind of amazing help he gives you every single time. Armies and legions of help. Legions of angels showing up to aid you with your problems. Your problem may be this small, Allah's help will be that big. Because he's nasir. Subhanallah. That's Allah being qawi. And Allah giving us his, from his quwa, from his might, him aiding us when we hold on to him. May Allah Azza wa make us people that really internalize our own weakness and recognize the strength of our master. Barakallahu li wa lakum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.